Well, the Harris-Trump presidential debate in Philadelphia is now history, and Americans are digesting what they heard and whether it's going to impact how they vote. I want to get some more results from our post-debate instant polls. Our political director, David Chalian, is back with us. David, uh, what else are you learning? Yeah, Anderson, this is a poll of debate watchers, not of the country overall or the electorate, obviously. Uh, but it's not that uh, partisanly, in a partisan way, different uh, than what we see broadly among registered voters. Uh, this is really interesting. Among the candidates' favorable and unfavorable ratings, take a look here at what we found. Before the debate, Harris's favorable rating was at 39%. After the debate, among these debate watchers, her favorability rating went up six points to 45 percent. Donald Trump actually ticked down two points among these debate watchers from 41 percent favorable to 39 percent favorable. Uh, that's about roughly the same. That's not a two percent tick down there is not huge. But I do want to note Kamala Harris's uptick driven a lot by independent voters. She was minus 17 uh, more unfavorable than favorable among these debate watchers going into the debate. And independent debate watchers, they were plus nine for her favorability coming out of the debate. So a big movement change on her favorability with independents. Take a look at when we asked debate watchers about the confidence in the candidates to uh, lead the country, the ability to lead the country, and the confidence that uh, debate watchers have in that. This is really interesting because even though she was the clear winner in the debate among debate watchers, Take a look. 32% say a lot of confidence in her, in her ability to lead the country. And 36% say that about him. Uh, she's a little bit better among those who say some confidence uh, in the ability to lead the country. If you add the a lot and the some together, they're both at 54%. Um, and so they're quite even on this score, which I think is pretty uh, interesting. And then who had a better plan for solving the country's problems? Harris won on this score among these debate watchers as well. 42% say Kamala Harris had a better plan for solving the country's problem. That's compared to 33% who said Trump. And look, Anderson, 22%. One in five of debate watchers says neither of these two had a good plan for solving the country's problem. Uh, that, not necessarily double haters here, obviously, but that seems to be a target audience uh, for both of these candidates to talk to and explain their plans to over the next eight weeks. Yeah, interesting. David Jallian, thanks so much. John Kim, what do you make of those numbers? Well, number one, it tells you we enter the debate in a very close competitive race, and we'll leave the debate in a very close competitive race. Mm -hmm. However, however, advantage Harris on a couple of very significant points. Uh, David Jallian noting that where she jumped up was among independent voters. We knew coming into this debate that the largest audience of people, the largest percentage of people who said they were open to changing their mind were people who self-identify as independents, or as moderates. So the middle of the American electorate, uh, the people who live in the suburbs, the people who uh, maybe voted for Trump in 2016 and Biden in 2020 aren't, you know, incredibly partisan. Uh, they're looking for solutions. They're looking for pragmatism. So the fact that her movement was among independents, who had the better debate about solving the country's problems? She came into the debate at a deficit with Trump on the economy. It's a different question. That question was solving the country's problems. But it shows she made progress with people. Are you a president? Right? That was her biggest challenge. Nobody knows the mm -hmm. vice president, whether it's Mike Pence or whether it's Dan Quayle or whether it's Al Gore. You know, you're trying to rise from vice president, whether it's Joe Biden. You're trying to rise from president to vice president. You have to prove I'm ready for the first job. Uh, it is clear. It is clear that she cleared that bar tonight. Now, that does not mean that she's not still in a very competitive race. But if her progress tonight was among independents, now the question is, can you carry that momentum forward? We count votes eight weeks from tonight. Mm. Uh, still close, still competitive, but in an election that we all expect is going to be decided on the margins, tonight anyway, the question is, can she hold it? She moved the margins that matter. You know, uh, that, one, that one graph of uh, capability to lead the country the fact that they're basically dead even. Right. I mean, think about where we were seven weeks ago. Wow. Would you have predicted that seven weeks later that Kamala Harris and Donald Trump would be polling evenly? Donald Trump, a former president, uh, you know, and whatever you think about him, there is a presumption that goes with the fact that you were president, that you know the job and so on. You know, so I, I do think that she filled that 
Uh, she checked that box tonight. She looked like a president on that stage. There's not a lot of, of elasticity in this electorate, so I wouldn't expect huge movements right. here. But this isn't going to be a race that's uh, won that way. It's going to be won incrementally. She took an incremental step forward. So, uh, so I'm a little bit surprised by that, by those numbers, because this is as good as it's going to get for Kamala Harris, presumably. I mean, this was, uh, this was you know, Donald Trump's presumably like, worst nightmare that you could have. If you're a Trump supporter, you watch this night, you say... He didn't talk about any of those kitchen table issues like, like uh, Alyssa was talking about, right? It was grievances. It was rear view mirror, not, not windshield. It was all the, the bad stuff. And yet, he's still tied, right? We're still right there. We're still neck and neck. And it's going to come down, again, to the people in Erie County, Northampton County, Macomb County, Michigan. It, it, the question is, are 50,000 people swayed in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, were they swayed tonight? Are they going to be swayed the next eight weeks? Because that's where that's where they are. That's, that's those fifty to seventy-five thousand. And did those eat away? As John points out, are those independents? Were it's, those swayed enough to come over and stay there uh, for I'll the next you, eight I'll weeks? Maybe, maybe not. But his iceberg is melting. I'll tell you that. Like she, she did well by herself. It, it, you're right. It's going to be clawing forward. It's going to be clawing forward. But you know, he did a lot of stuff that was just, that we haven't even gotten to. Mm -hmm. That's just horrible. He wouldn't say that he wanted Ukraine to win. Now you think about that. It's a very easy thing to say that you want a, a democracy that, the, that, that we've rallied the world behind, that frankly people in Pennsylvania, munitions being made there are going to help. Gas that's being fracked there is going to help. He wouldn't even stick up for the Ukrainians in Pennsylvania when Pennsylvanians are helping us win there. This, he did terrible well, he could have, He could have more clearly absolutely stated Look, I'm not, I would not sign a, an abortion bill if it came across my sure. desk. He got into the nitty-gritty about not 60 you know, votes in the Senate. Right? On abortion, let's actually play what, uh, what, what both of the candidates said on, on the topic. One does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government, and Donald Trump certainly, should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. I have talked with women around our country. You want to talk about this is what people wanted? Pregnant women who want to carry a pregnancy to term, suffering from a miscarriage, being denied care in an emergency room because the health care providers are afraid they might go to jail, and she's bleeding out in a car in the parking lot? She didn't want that. Her husband didn't want that. A 12 or 13 year old survivor of incest being forced to carry a pregnancy to term. They don't want that. What I did is something for 52 years. They've been trying to get Roe v. Wade into the states and through the uh, genius and, and heart and strength of six Supreme Court justices. We were able to do that. Now, I believe in the exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. I believe strongly in it. Ronald Reagan did also. 85% of Republicans do exceptions. Very important. But we were able to get it, and now states are voting on it. It's the vote of the people now. It's not tied up in the federal government. I did a great service in doing it. It took courage to do it. And the Supreme Court had great courage in doing it. And I give tremendous credit to those six justices. You know, I, I thought that was probably one of her best responses Absolutely. in the debate. Um, and what Donald Trump did that we didn't play there is in that response, he threw people under the bus mm -hmm. through his vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance, saying we didn't talk about whether or not he would veto a national abortion ban. He threw Kansas and Ohio under the bus. He <laughs> said those were liberal votes. Um, last I checked, Ohio, my home state and Kansas are pretty red, but that the American public are not actually where... Donald Trump and the Republican Party want to go on abortion. But what I think she also did was, in this debate, on abortion on many issues, was, you know, I'm the coalition's person. She talked to different parts of her coalition. We know women are going to be critical. This is the first presidential since the fall of Roe. We actually don't know if it's going to carry over. I think it will still be a, a top of um, the ticket issue. But so Donald Trump talks about um, sorority. He, she went to a sorority party. Let me tell you. <laughs> As a, part, as a person who was a part of a black sorority, that was offensive to black people who know the history. It's not a party. It's a, it's a public service organization. So she didn't go there and talk about it, but she talked about, you know, the Central Park Five when he baited her there. She talked about Dick Cheney. I know we probably all were, like, watching Dick Cheney and, and Liz Cheney endorse because we follow this every single day. But some people probably didn't know he endorsed. That speaks to those Republicans in Erie, Pennsylvania, that you still talk to. And then the independents. 
showing again, yet he can't be a mature adult and not scream when he gets upset about crowd size. Uh, total running time for each presidential candidate after tonight's heated Harris-Trump debate wrapped up a little while ago. Former President Trump speaking uh, just under 43 minutes, Vice President Harris speaking just over 37 and a half minutes. Plus, we just got the first results from our instant poll of debate watchers. Stand by for that. We're getting, uh, we'll be right back. Or no, actually, we'll keep going. We're getting the first reaction to the debate from our focus group, from uh, voters in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. Phil Mattingly is with them in Erie, Pennsylvania. So tell us who you're with and what they're saying about the debate. Yeah, Anderson, we talk about how critical Pennsylvania is for each candidate's pathway to 270 electoral votes. We're here in Erie County, uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. We're sitting currently at Mercyhurst University, been wonderful host for us. The reason why we're here 400 miles away from the debate is Erie County is the swingiest county in the most important swing state of this campaign. There's no question about it. When Obama in 2012, when Trump in 2016, when Biden in 2020, the last two cycles, just about 1,500 votes each separated the two candidates. So we wanted to ask voters who have not made a firm decision yet who they want to vote for, what they actually saw in this debate. Now, these are voters that have in the past supported Republicans and Democrats. They have in the past shown support for pr former President Trump or for Joe Biden. But coming into this night, they told us that they had not made up their minds yet in this election. So just to step back a little bit, show our focus group two people, Erie residents, again, most important state, most important county in that state. We asked for a show of hands before the debate who hadn't made up their mind yet, but thought this debate may determine where they would go with their vote. To start with this debate, who do you think won by show of hands, former President Trump? Two, I'll give it four, but tentative. Two over there. What about Vice President Harris? More hands. For those of you who thought this debate could be determinative, how many of you have made up your minds based on what you saw tonight on stage in Philadelphia? Raise your hands. All right, I wanna ask you why. What did you see that brought you to a conclusion? I think it's important to remember that we are voting for the leader of our country and not who we like the most or who we want in our wedding party, but who is actually going to make our country better. And we're in an incredibly unique situation where we've had both of the candidates in office before and we've gotten to see what they would do. And when facts come to facts, my life was better when Trump was in office. The economy was higher, inflation was lower things were better overall. And now with um, Kamala's administration, things haven't been so fantastic. And she's saying she can fix the problems that her administration has caused, but I just don't know if I can afford to take that risk. Were you leaning towards the former president coming in tonight? Probably. And did you vote for him in 2016 or 2020? I did. So decision made there. What did you think? As to who I would vote for in this election, mm -hmm. um, I strongly felt Camilla was more optimistic, more respectful. Um, I thought she had plans that she um, tried to describe in the minutes worth of time that she had. Um, I mean, they really were limited with their time. So, um, I don't know, I just felt more strongly for her as opposed to her opponent. I, I want to talk about some of the moments of the debate because uh, as we told you guys before the debate, each of these individuals had a dial. And if they turned the dial to the right, then they felt positive about what they were hearing in that moment. If they turned it to the left, they felt less so. They felt negative about what they were hearing. We could track that throughout the debate. We're going to show you a couple of moments where you saw the biggest movement towards positive direction for both of those candidates. You will see the lines at the bottom of the screen and you will see that movement as the sound we play you plays out. We're gonna start with this. Because they're radical, the Democrats are radical in that. And her vice presidential pick, which I think was a horrible pick, by the way, for our country, because he is really out of it. But her vice presidential pick says abortion in the ninth month is absolutely fine. He also says execution after birth. It's execution, no longer abortion, because the baby is born, is okay. 
And that's not okay with me. Hence the vote. Trump abortion bans that make no exception even for rape and incest, which understand what that means. A survivor of a crime of violation to their body does not have the right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. That is immoral. And one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government, and Donald Trump certainly, should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. Now that sound, obviously, that moment was a critical moment, uh, not just for the debate on one of the critical issues of this campaign on the issue of reproductive rights and abortion, but it was also one that garnered significant reaction from our focus group, which I want to ask about right now. For those of you who responded positively to Vice President Harris's answer, tell me why. I, yes. Yeah, please. Um, I responded positively to her answer because... Um, I do struggle with the abortion issue, and I don't know that she and I agree, but I don't know that, um, like she said, that, that government should be in charge of people's decisions. And I um, think that there, the when she was talking about situations of rape and incest, um, I think that those happen more than we think that they do. And I just, I, I don't know, I just felt... Um, her impassioned response and that she would carry it out. And that resonated with you in the moment? Yes, it did. Who else had a positive response? Go ahead, please. I felt like it was her most genuine and passionate that I saw her pretty much throughout it. Um, I didn't necessarily agree with what she was saying, but my favorable reactions were because it was nice to see the passion and believability that she stands behind and then have something to gauge more of what she says on since she hasn't spoken a lot solidly about a lot of issues. And I think what's been interesting, again, following how you guys were tracking the debate, which is a fascinating experience, and, and I should know, we, nobody in this room has been listening to the post-game coverage, nobody in this room has been listening to the analysis. We've actually all been talking amongst ourselves, but it's been a really great conversation. Um, there was another critical moment, and this was Donald Trump's best moment based on your guys' responses, and it was when he was discussing Afghanistan. Listen. We were getting out. We would have been out faster than them, but we wouldn't have lost the soldiers. We wouldn't have left many Americans behind, and we wouldn't have left, we wouldn't have left $85 billion worth of brand new, beautiful military equipment behind. And just to finish, they blew it. The agreement said you have to do this, 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 and they didn't do it. They didn't do it. The agreement was was terminated by us because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So that was the former president talking about the Afghanistan withdrawal where 13 U.S. service members were killed in that chaotic process. You're a veteran. Yes, sir. Uh, there are obviously personal feelings here as well. That answer, and it's been an issue that he's talked about constantly on the campaign. What stood out to you for it? When I first heard that we were abandoning or we were withdrawing from Afghanistan and the, the way it was happening, I had my Kennedy moment. It was very similar to when we decided to invade Iraq back under President Bush. And when I saw that we were leaving that amount of high-tech equipment in the hands of our enemy, and later that, that day or later that week, I saw on the news where them celebrating with our guns in their hands, I realized what a travesty that was. A, in the loss of money in that let we abandoned when we left, plus the very bullets that we left there that they were shooting at us, at us as we flew away into planes.